Hi, today I'm going to talk about a new album that I have out. It's called Mark Hommel Presents the East Bay Blues Vaults 1976 to 1988. And what I'm going to get into is how I ended up putting the CD out with Electrify Records. It's called from 45s that I've had sitting in, in my closet for 35, 40 years. It's some of the earliest things that I ever performed. I was in my early 20s. People like Boogie Jake, Cool Papa, Mississippi Johnny Waters, Sonny Rhodes. Later on, uh, people like Brownie McGee, Sonny Lane, Ron Thompson, Paris Slim. Many of the people that were on the scene at the time that were vital in making this musical blending of, of black musicians, white musicians, and all of us just playing together and, and getting to know each other, becoming friends, and creating all this great blues music that was happening during this period of time. The scene is nothing like it used to be back in the 70s and 80s. We would play at places like the Playboy Club out in Richmond, Eli's Ma High Club in Oakland, later on the Deluxe, the Shalimar in Berkeley, Dottie's in San Francisco, Dottie's Stardust Lounge, Minnie's Can Do in The Hate. This is where I met a lot of these musicians when, when I uh, came to the Bay Area. The first guy I met was Ron Thompson. And when I first met him, he was playing on the steps of Berkeley uh, at Sproul Plaza, just playing with a national guitar, playing the hell out of the slide. Uh, you know, Robert Johnson stuff, uh, Jimmy Reed, all of this, Elmore James, all this great music. And I, and I asked him, I said, you know, where do I go to meet some of these blues people that, uh, you know, that, that I'm assuming there's some kind of blues scene around here? And he goes, well, the first place you should go is, is uh, the Playboy Club in West Richmond. There's a, uh, a guy named Cool Papa who runs a jam session down there, and you can meet a lot of musicians through him. And the first time I went to the Playboy Club, I, I mean, I didn't even, I thought it was Hugh Hefner's Playboy Club. And I called up information and I asked, is there a Hugh Hefner's Playboy Club in Richmond, California? They said, no such listing. And I said, well, is there a Playboy Club? And she goes, well, there's the Playboy Club, T-H-E-E. -E. And I said, give me that number. And I called him up. And I think the next day I went down to a jam session on a Sunday afternoon. I think me and the ba bass player were the only white guys in the club at the time. A guy I got to know later on and play with, Charles Huff, was up on stage singing. Cool Papa was playing guitar. These guys were so approachable. Cool Papa, at the end of, after hearing me play, he said, my harmonica player is going to be gone for a month. Would you be able to sub for my harmonica player and play like four nights a week for the next month? And I said, of course. I was thrilled to death. And so he was really my introduction along with Ron to the whole Bay Area scene. Through Cool Pop, I heard about people like Johnny Waters. I heard about Sonny Rhodes, J.J. Malone. Uh, later on, I met Troy Key, who opened Eli's Mile High Club after Eli was murdered in the doorway. I met uh, Boogie Jake not long after that, who happened to be Little Walter's cousin. I played with him for a year. Um, these are just my, these are really my earliest memories of, of a lot of these musicians and, and also my earliest recordings. This, I was kind of exposing myself on this stuff in the, in the sense that, you know, I'd never recorded on that. Very first recording with Boogie Jake, I'd never played in a studio before. So it was, it, it's, it's a little bit intimidating to put that stuff out there, but I put out there because, hey, I was only 23 or 24 at the time that I made this record. The first video I'd like to show is a, a guy, a beautiful guy that I got to play with, you know, um, when I first went to the Playboy Club. This is Cool Papa. And this is a video of, of myself and Paris Slim backing up Cool Papa at Larry Blake's.
Cool Papa Sadler with myself and Paris Slim backing uh, him up in uh, Larry Blake's in the early 80s, as I recall. The next guy I want to talk a little bit about is still uh, with us. He's one of the few guys, I think, besides me and Paris Slim on this recording that's still around. And his name is Sonny Rhodes. His real name is Clarence Smith. Sonny Rhodes was a real character. I met Sonny when I first went to Eli's Mile High Club in Oakland, California. And I met Sonny right away. The way Sonny introduced himself to me is he said, you're a harmonica player, huh, son? My name is Sonny Rhodes. What's your name? I want to ask you a couple questions before I decide if I'm going to have you play with Sonny Rhodes. First of all, you ever heard of Charlie Musselwhite? I said, yes. He said, Charlie Musselwhite plays with me. You ever heard of Rick Estrin? I said, yeah, Rick's great. Rick Estrin plays with me. You ever heard of Gary Smith? I said, yeah, I love Gary Smith. Gary Smith plays with me. So tell me, son, do you want to play with Sonny Rhodes? And that was my introduction to Sonny. And Sonny, Sonny was, uh, uh, the best way to put, put it about Sonny back in the day was that he was a real instigator. He was a very funny guy. He was very comical, but he was also a badass. He really was very respected out of Texas. He comes from Smithville, Texas, and he was very respected by guys like Freddie King and Johnny Copeland. Albert Collins, all these guys looked up to Sonny because he really had a, he had a very much of a bravado in the way that he presented himself on stage. He had a great voice. He was a great guitar player. He also played lap steel about, you know, he started playing lap steel not long after I met him. Uh, he got turned onto the lap steel guitar from a guy named L.C. Goodrock and Robinson, who was another character. Uh, and another guy from Texas. He, uh, I think LC said he actually played for Bonnie and Clyde at a picnic back in the day in the 20s. So these guys had v very interesting histories. I remember when I first met Sonny, him telling me that he had been Junior Parker's valet. Junior Parker was one of my favorite singers and harmonica players when I first got into all this stuff. He was very popular. In, in the Oakland Richmond scene. Sonny was soon to follow in his footsteps. Sonny became somebody that was very popular going to Europe. He made countless record albums. I think the best way to put it with a lot of the East Bay uh, uh, mentors to people like myself and Ron and, and Paris Slim was that they really kind of showed us the ropes of, of uh, what it was like to play in blues clubs. I remember playing a great gig with Sonny Rhodes on New Year's at the Playboy Club in Richmond. And, um, I, you know, I think Sonny was falling asleep. He was so drunk, he was like falling asleep and the drummer would like poke him with a drumstick to wake him up. And he'd come right back in on tune on the, on the, <laughs> the steel, lap steel guitar. Uh, but, but I recall on New Year's Eve, there was a bunch of, uh, at midnight, they did the countdown to New Year's. And out back, there was, sounded like fireworks going off. It turned out it was people shooting their revolvers into the air. And uh, luckily, none went through the roof and landed on me on stage. But uh, Sonny was really a character and, and still is a character. I saw him one time would uh, uh, go up to uh, uh, Jimmy Dawkins out of Chicago and say, Jimmy. I want to know why you're coming and stealing Sonny Rhodes gigs. I love it when guys speak in the third person as well. Why you come to Oakland, California and steal Sonny Rhodes gigs when you could be back in Chicago, I don't come to Chicago and steal your gigs. And here you are stealing some of Sonny Rhodes gigs. <laughs> he, this guy was really a character. He would wear a turban back at the time. He called himself the Sheik of West Oakland and the Disciple of the Blues. I remember in two, after 2001, Sonny told me he stopped wearing his turban because he got too many death threats from rednecks in bars that he was playing at. Because Sonny would travel all over the United States. He, he had a, a, his wife would route him you know, in Denver one night and Edmonton, Canada the next. So uh, we, would see, <laughs> we would see Sonny show up 
and 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 a bunch of guys would get out of the van in a little minivan and they'd all be packed in the minivan and Sonny, Sonny was just so used to it. And now I want to talk about one of my mainstays. This was a guy I started my band The Blues Survivors with, Johnny Waters. His real name is Johnny Sandifer. He was from Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, as I say, he was about 20 years older than me. And Johnny was somebody I heard about the first time from uh, Ron Thompson riding down the freeway. And Ron told me, was just telling me about all these different musicians that he knew about. Uh, people like, you know, Mike Watson, who became Junior Watson, or Gary Smith, Rick Estrin, J.J. Uh, Malone. Uh, and I remember him telling me about Sonny Lane, who was in our, blue, our band, The Blues Survivors, and also a guy named Johnny Sandifer, who became Johnny Waters. The reason he became Johnny Waters, or Mississippi Johnny Waters, is because he sounded so close to Muddy Waters that he could do these songs and definitely pull them off in a way that most ordinary blues players could not sing them. Johnny had a fantastic voice. He was also a good guitar player, played uh, everything from Jimmy Rogers and Muddy Waters and Little Walter style to Jimmy Reed to B.B. King, to Chuck Berry, to John Lee Hooker. He could play pretty much in any style, and vocally he was just tremendous. The way I got hooked up with Johnny was that I walked into Eli's Mile High Club at a jam session, and Johnny was up on stage singing Muddy Waters' Country Boy. Uh, don't say I don't love you because I don't never treat you right. And he was singing that, and I went, this guy is a guy I gotta play with. And I introduced myself to him and we got back up there and we played a song together and it just felt like a natural match. Johnny was, because he was from Mississippi, he had an affinity for the Chicago blues. A lot of people in Oakland and, and Richmond were from Texas and Louisiana. The fact that Johnny was from Mississippi gave him a leg up on a lot of the blues musicians because he had really had that deep background in in all the, 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 the people I mentioned, Muddy and Otis Rush and, and uh, um, Jimmy Rogers, Little Walter, he sang all that stuff. And there was really nobody else around the Bay Area uh, that was from the Bay Area like Johnny was, uh, other than people like John Lee Hooker or Luther Tucker, who were transplants. Johnny was really one of the, the transplants that was local that really had the depth of, of all these same guys. I remember he used to sing one of the greatest versions of I Can't Quit You or My Love Will Never Die by Otis Rush. He could sing uh, Hoochie Coochie Man or Country Boy or uh, Sail On, all these Muddy Waters songs with just such a depth. And, and we actually met Muddy. I remember me and Johnny would go to shows together and, and we went and saw Muddy Waters a number of times back in the day. And... Uh, we went over to the hotel he, that Muddy and the band used to stay at across the street from my house in Berkeley. It was the Thunderbird Hotel, as I recall, or the, no, the Flamingo Motel. Uh, it was literally a half a block from my house. So me and Johnny went over there one time and we knocked on Muddy's door and he invited us in. Muddy was a very gracious host and, and, and Johnny went to Muddy and said, Muddy, I have a request. I'm wondering if you'd let myself, if you would let me call myself Johnny Waters, because I can sing your stuff. And he goes, I don't care what you call yourself as long as you put my name on the songs that you record of mine. And and so that to Johnny was Muddy giving him, giving him his blessing to call himself Johnny Waters. And when Muddy called himself Mississippi John, uh, Muddy Waters, Johnny changed his name to Mississippi Johnny Waters. And we started this band, The Blues Survivors, originally with a guy named J.J. Jones. And J.J. called me up, I remember in 1976, J.J. called me up and he goes, Mark, I want to start a band. And I got a guy named Johnny Waters. And I go, you talk about Johnny Sanderford? He goes, yes. And, and I go, well, you can count me in. He goes, can you find a rhythm section? <laughs> And <laughs> right then I figured out what he was talking about. He wanted me to basically get the gigs and find the band. So that's what I went and did. We had the, the house band gig at Eli's My High Club for two months. And one day JJ calls me up and he goes, Mark, I got bad news. I'm going back to driving a truck. And I was like, wow, that's horrible. 
you know, we're really just getting this thing off the ground. He goes, yeah, it's sad news. But the following weekend, he was at Eli's with another band. <laughs> So obviously we got the shaft and that was the way of doing it. So I called up Johnny. I said, let's keep the band going. Let's find another guitar player. And we got his old friend, Sonny Lane. And so we had Sonny Lane on guitar, Johnny Waters on guitar. I got a guy named Lex Silva eventually in the band on bass, who was John Lee Hooker and Luther Tucker's old bass player, Ron Thompson's old bass player. I got a guy named Gary Hine to play drums and we started, we kept the blues survivors going. So it became Mississippi Johnny Waters and the blues survivors. Now, this went on till about 1980, 81. So we had the band for approximately four years with, with that lineup. But eventually Johnny went to Europe with uh, Tom Maslini and the SF Blues Festival. And they had big success over in Europe with, uh, I think, Luther Tucker, Ron Thompson, um, J.C. Burris, I think Sonny Rhodes was on that tour, and they played every major city in Europe with Tom and the SF Blues Festival Review. And when Johnny came back, he had kind of realized that the Chuck Berry stuff and the B.B. King stuff was working for him as good or better than the, the Muddy Waters and Little Walter stuff. So when that happened, I kind of felt like, well, my harmonica doesn't really fit very good on the on the Chuck Berry stuff and the B.B. King stuff, you know, maybe I'll try to do something on my own. So I kind of, I, I think Johnny kind of looked at it like I stole the name, but because I was doing all the grunt work of booking gigs and finding band members, I kind of felt like, well, you know, it's as much my band as it was Johnny's. And Johnny kind of went his own way. I went my own way. Uh, eventually we kind of, you know, there was a little bit of animosity the first few months or whatever, but eventually me and Johnny worked it out and uh, I continued to do gigs with him up until uh, he got, he and Sonny Lane both got uh, very ill by 1986 and, and they both died within months of each other. We put on a giant benefit, I remember, at the Omni in Oakland for these guys and had a star-studded review of uh, uh, John Lee Hooker, uh, Brownie McGee, who I was also performing with at the time, uh, Little Charlie and the Nightcats, uh, Ron Thompson and the Resistors, uh, Jimmy McCracklin, J.J. Malone, Troy's Key. Uh, it was just a, a really amazing lineup. Uh, and, and we raised quite a bit of money for, for Johnny and Sonny back then. But the main thing is it was really, you know, a way of paying back these guys who were, I mean, Sonny was really one of my good friends. I talked to Sonny every day on the phone, um, and, and me and Johnny got to be friends uh, off and on during that time. Uh, unfortunately, Johnny did drink a lot, and sometimes that affected our performances. But all in all, I mean, he was really, a, he was a very warm person, and he was uh, somebody that was a real inspiration to all of us just because he was such a powerful singer. So uh, I wanted to just uh, uh, show a clip of Johnny playing at Eli's Ma High Club around 1980 as well. In the background, you can see J.J. Malone. I think Paul Green is on harmonica. This was the Rhythm Rockers playing behind uh, uh, Mississippi Johnny Waters. All right, that was Mississippi Johnny Waters live at Eli's Mile High Club with the Rhythm Rockers backing him up at Eli's Mile High Club in Oakland. A lot of people don't realize the depth of Oakland blues in the Bay Area. Uh, both Oakland and Richmond had very active blues scenes from the 1940s on. And this was due to a migration of workers that Kaiser Steel brought in from both Louisiana and Texas and moved to uh, temporary housing in both Richmond and Oakland 
to work at the shipyards during World War II building Liberty ships. Now this brought in not only the workers, but the music that the workers listened to. And the, the workers were listening to blues music, essentially. People like T-Bone Walker, uh, Lowell Folson made his very first records in Oakland. Jimmy McCracklin made his first records in Oakland. Uh, Big Mama Thornton and Pee Wee Creighton and many others were performing at these, these Oakland and Richmond venues. Clubs like the Savoy Club in Richmond, the Continental Club later on in, in Oakland. Uh, there were many, many famous uh, venues back in the day. Uh, there was a guy named Bob Geddens who owned a radiator shop and he started a record company called Big Town Records. He had quite a few different labels, but essentially he got a hold of people like Lowell Folson and his brother uh, Martin. He got a hold of Jimmy McCracklin. So McCracklin claimed that he wrote Thrill is Gone, the song by B.B. King, that he wrote that for an artist that appeared on Geddon's label. There, were, there was a lot of great music coming out of Oakland at the time. People like Johnny Hartsman were playing guitar. Lafayette Thing Thomas was on McCracklin Records. Uh, Al King, uh, so many artists that were uh, coming out of Oakland at the time. A lot of them were fairly obscure, kind of like the artists that are on my record. I mean, a lot of the, the artists on my record are not well known. The most famous one would be Brownie McGee. Uh, I recorded the, the cut on this album. That was recorded at a session I did in 1984 with, with Brownie. Uh, he came in and recorded with uh, Francis Clay on drums, who was another friend of mine. Somebody like Sonny Rhodes was, uh, was recording in Oakland in the, in the 70s. A lot of people were moving from the Central Valley as well. Somebody like J.J. Malone or Sonny Rhodes or Troy's Key, they all met in Fresno, California. And uh, people like Casey Douglas lived in Fresno and moved, Mercy D. Walton moved out from Fresno to the Bay Area. So somebody like J.J. Malone is on, on this record, uh, was, a, was not only a great guitar player, he was a tremendous guitar player. And I met him through, uh, Troy's Key, as I recall, when Troy's came to my house and wanted to take harmonica lessons and we never even got around to it because all we did was talk about blues records. Uh, but when I met Troy's, uh, that a night or two later, I went and saw Troy's playing at a place called Minnie's Can Do in, on the Hate uh, in San Francisco. And uh, I met J.J. Malone, I met, Troy, uh, I met Charles Banks on bass, I met uh, C.A. Carr on saxophone. And these guys were all guys I became friends with uh, in the er, in the late in the mid '70s, and so uh, J.J. Malone is somebody I did put a couple tracks of his on here because uh, he made an album for Troy's Keys label, Eli's Mile High Club Records, uh, that that featured him with a court with just a a trio, and he has uh, bass bass and drums on it. And he's featured on this record on two songs. I have uh, Boogie Jake on here, who was somebody that was Little Walter's cousin who had moved out from Marksville, Louisiana. And when I found out he was Little Walter's cousin, I flipped and I asked him every story I could about Little Walter. And he told me probably some tall tales, but probably some truth in there as well. Uh, uh, Jake played guitar, played in more of a lightning Slim, uh, if you know who Lightning Slim was, he was kind of a Lightning Hopkins wannabe from Crowley, Louisiana, who played on the Accello records. Boogie Jake could play both that style, that Lightning Slim style, but he could also do the uh, Little Walter song. So I bugged him to play those, and he'd try to do B.B. King stuff, and he'd usually mangle that up pretty good because uh, he'd get lost on the changes. I mean, one of the things about a lot of the old cats, they didn't play... Uh, guitar, you know, in regular time, they tended to jump time a lot of times. People like Lightning Hopkins or, or Boogie Jake or some of them, Lightning Slim, they wouldn't play in regular time. Or when I got to know people like Snooky Pryor, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't play in regular time. They would jump time. And so if you were a young white blues player, player like most of us were, you learned to kind of listen to the vocals and you learned to to listen to where the guitar was going, you didn't assume they were gonna play. That was a white boy thing to assume that it was gonna stay a 12 bar progression. You had to listen to the, the vocals to, to follow. So um, 
when I, when I played with Jake, I learned to kind of this is this was all kind of a trial and error of a you know young white guy trying to learn to play blues. You know, this is how you learn. Sonny Lane, you know, like I say, who was who was a friend of mine, and you know, uh, from the time I was playing in the Blues Survivors, and and he really told me about all these guys like Pat Hare and and Sammy Lawhorn and all these Chicago guys that were lesser known to the general public, but but to my ears, I started finding out about all these players from these older guys, guys like Sonny and Johnny. This was this was my education, was was hearing it, you know, Sonny, Sonny Lane was a very funny guy too. He'd say, man, them guys in Europe, man, they just want you to wear overalls and get up there and talk about plowing a mule. But now a guy get up there and he, well, three piece suit and he come in on a seven foot of seven. <laughs> so he liked just kind of, you know, Sonny was a real character too, because he was like, he was way into Loretta Lynn. That was his favorite. He was a lot of fun to hang out with. These, this, this was kind of like I say, this was my education in the blues. So the very first version of the blues survivors, uh, at one point in the in 1977, we had Johnny on guitar. Sonny Lane on guitar, but we also hired this young, funny white kid named Pat Chase. And Pat was a lefty, and he was a hell of a guitar player. He 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 he's still around. He lives in El Paso now, and he called himself Guitar Slim. And he would play left-handed and play the hell out of the guitar. And all the guys that I played with when Pat was in the band, like Brownie McGee and and Lowell Folson. Uh, you know, Johnny and Sonny, they loved the way Pat played because he really went for the guts when he, when he played, you know. And he still does. He's still a great guitar player down in El Paso. But uh, what I was going to show now was a gig of me and, me and Pat and uh, uh, June Core on drums and a guy named Slim Medina on bass. And this is from a gig we did in Boulder, Colorado. This is just a little clip of it. And we're playing a, a song by Junior Parker called Feeling Good. I want to say I'd only been going on the road about two years at the point that this, this clip was done. And, and when I watched it, somebody sent this to me recently in the last couple of years. And I was like, wow, did I have a lot of energy back then. So anyway, here's a little clip of 1988 Mark Hummel. Now right here, I got a little story to tell you. Day, I was walking down the street. I saw Pat Chase there. Decided we'd stop getting my deep. Where'd we go? Well, we were in North Plant, you see. Yeah. We were on 104th Avenue. Uh huh. And we pulled into the local McDonald's. Uh, that's Shea McDonald's. We did. We did, and we got a a, a lay Big Mac. Lay Big Mac. That's and right. before I ate the Big Mac. You said, what's happening? Uh, and I said this, this was before I ate the Big Mac. I said, Here's what I've been doing since I was 20. Back in the blues clubs in Oakland and, and Richmond, the audiences knew the version of this song by Junior Parker and maybe by Jimmy Rogers, but probably Junior Parker. And it was it's a great blues song I fell in love with early on. And later on it came too true. Called That's Alright. <laughs> Baby, once upon a time, you said if I be on, you would sure be mine, but that's all right. I know you're loving some other man, but that's all right. Well, 
world every now and then I wonder Who's loving you tonight? You told me, baby Your love for me was strong When I woke up this morning, you know your big word was gone, but that's all right. I know you don't love me no more, baby, but that's all right. Well, every now and yeah, then I wonder who's loving you tonight. When I was loving you, baby, just couldn't understand. Now you're gone and left me for some other man, but that's all right. I know you don't love me no more, baby, but that's all right. Every now and then I wonder who's loving you tonight. Some of the main, but that's all right. Well, every now and then I wonder who's loving you tonight. Ha, ha, ha.